I'm Robert Polito, director of the New School Graduate Writing Program, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome you to this special evening with Kaveh Kanem. I want to, first of all, I want to thank all of our dear friends at Kaveh Kanem, but particularly Allison Myers, Hafiza Jeter, and Jackie Jones. Along. It's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. And um, tonight's focus is on, is on new work, three books of, of new writing, great new writing. But I think that whether the focus of Kave Kanem is on new work or legacy work, they, they always manage to exemplify, I think, what's best and boldest and smartest about, about contemporary poetry. And everyone at the New School values this collaboration enormously. So it's my pleasure now also to turn the evening over for closer introductions to Afiza Jeter. And welcome. Hi, good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm Hafiza Jeter. I'm the Program and Communications Coordinator at Kaveh Kanem, a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of African American poets. Throughout the year, we offer a lot of great programming, including our New Works reading at NYU on April 18th, featuring Colleen J. McElroy, Ramika Bingham, and Don Lenny Martin. And on April 23rd, we will be coming back to the new school with new work from Cave Cotton Fellows, C.M. Burroughs, Yona Harvey, and Jonathan Moody. I'd also like to thank Robert Polito and Lori Lynn Turner for their thoughtful work and offering a welcoming place for Cave Cotton at the new school. We would also like to thank our funders, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the Mrs. Giles Whiting Foundation. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight we're excited to present our new work series featuring R. Erica Doyle, Bianca Spriggs, and Marcus Wicker. R. Erica Doyle was born in Brooklyn to Trinidadian immigrant parents. Her book Proxy was just released this month, I believe, right? Yeah, from Belladonna. Um, her work has been anthologized in Best American Poetry, Gumbo, A Celebration of African American Writing, Bum Rush the Page, A Deaf Poetry Jam, Gathering Ground, a reader celebrating Cave Kanem's first decade and, vo and Voices Rising, celebrating 20 years of black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender writing. Her poetry and fiction appear in various journals, including Plowshares, Callaloo, Bloom, From the Fish House, Blythe, Blythe House Quarterly, and Sinister Wisdom. Afro-Latin poet and Cave Kanem fellow, Bianca Spriggs, is a multidisciplinary artist who lives and works in Lexington, Kentucky. Currently a doctoral student at the University of Kentucky, Bianca is a Pushcart Prize nominee and a recipient of multiple grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women and the Kentucky Arts Council. In partnership with the K Kentucky Domestic Violence Association, she is the creator of the Swallowtail Project, a traveling creative writing workshop designed for an incarcerated woman. Bianca is the author of two poetry collections Kafir Lily from Wynn Publications, and How Swallowtails Become Dragons from Accents Publishing. And she currently serves as the managing editor for Pluck, the Afro-Latin Journal of Arts and Culture. And our final reader, Marcus Wicker, his first book, Maybe the Saddest Thing, was selected by D.A. Powell for the National Poetry Series and was released from HarperCollins in 2012. The recipient of a 2011 Ruth Lilly Fellowship he has, had, he has also held fellowships from Cave Canem, the Fine Arts Work Center, and Indiana University, where he received his MFA. His poems have appeared in Poetry, Ninth Letter, Third Coast, and other magazines. He is an assistant professor of English at the University of Southern Indiana. Please welcome our Erica Doyle. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Where's Robert? There you are. So um, I, actually, I actually went to the new school and in this very cafe <laughs> met with my thesis advisor, Cornelius Eady. Um, so it's really great to be back and um, I do want to thank Robert for um, all support through the years and he um, was a champion of my work to publishers who didn't publish it, but I appreciated his support. Um, and one of the uh, things I was thinking about is it's kind of been like a long road. You guys are getting my after work self, so be ready. Um, so, uh, you know, it's kind of been a long road, and one of the things are is this book has a, a lot more sex than most poetry books do. 
And I don't mean like Sharon Oles, a Pope's penis, or some period dripping into a toilet. Um, so, someone told me I should take the sex out of it, and it probably, like it finalized and stuff, people were looking at it. Um, and someone said, you should take the sex out, and I was like, what? <laughs> That's what makes me dangerous, apparently, to the Pope and his penis. Okay, so <laughs> this is Proxy, and uh, it's an unrequited love story in prose poems. Um, it also has a whole bunch of epigraphs from a tour of the calculus that I don't feel like reading tonight, so I'm not gonna, but they're in there. I'm gonna read um, the first long uh, epigraph from the tour of the calculus, but there's more in there. And I'm gonna read it sort of jumping around. Um, so, proxy. So I, I just I also wanna thank uh, one of my editors, em Emily Skilling, she's here, um, and for plucking this out of the ether, as it were, and going ahead on this dare. So proxy. And this is from a tour of the calculus. The mathematician is inclined to minimize the details. His intellectual movement retrograde to that of the novelist or physician. Revisiting the facts, the mathematician must resist the tug of those very rich, very voluptuous descriptions of reality that the novelist or physician might favor, dismissing them curtly in favor of two austere abstractions, change in position and change in time. Under the mathematician's hands, the world contracts, but it becomes more lucid. Proxy. This is the prologue. In this fairy tale, too, there is a castle on a rise above a river. You enter in a cycle. The dew is come in words. The grasp of the offered hand of falling into spin, craned, sequence, flashing, curious, the moment you knew everything. When she lifted her eyes from the plate, her gaze was a solar wind stripping the horse of your heart. You couldn't stop writing her, etched the letters along your ribs, painted subway tiles with a bloodied finger. A small underground paper proclaimed the nonsense. She is the gape of a second, a glyph you remembered how to read. The other lovers rattle their sabers. They don't see what. She's not really that. It's all a cumulus din you wait around in when she leaves for years. Her words, a dry arroyo. It is all an ice pack, Novocaine, delirium tremens, the haze left after a high fever until she comes back. You hope to perform an autopsy, the dead and nagging questions. The mountain you retreat to has a dirt road with a stream across it, and when it's dark, it's really dark, so you're glad she's come. You've come to do an autopsy and at the first excision found a beating heart. Is seven such a lucky number now? You've changed enough to be cynical. After seven years, you've regenerated every cell in your body. After seven years, there's some new constellation in your house of damage. After seven years, you fucked enough women to know better. After seven years, the slant of her eyes tilts your beautiful, wavering house, complete with wife and dog, into the chasm behind the curtain. After proxy. The next thing is semiotic and eternal. Your pen has dried. You're driving toward fanaticism. You're visiting the intrepid and pretending you're the captain. You're going to nuclear bomb something beautiful. You will leave no child behind. You are a naturally occurring phenomenon, a cyclone, a printer's gasp. Is it evil to rend so? Shrug without hesitation or apology. The ex-lover's eyes fill with tears. Raw fish sticks at the back of your throat. She crumbles. The ex-lover is so young, you think. Forget anything wise. Your bed is the frosty garden, October mornings, she's gone. A light is flashing somewhere, 
a disembodied voice announces textual desire. In your mind, you hear her call for water. If she were any closer, you'd eat her for dinner. As it is, you're starving and not. You weather this all with seeming good humor. Write notes to amuse yourself. You have become too earnest, trying so hard to mean something important. Watch the drain and hear your stomach growl. Negroes make me hungry too, she says. You need an explanation, but say nothing to this boastful non sequitur. You want to amuse her with your bones. If her writing were more precise, you'd read her more, in the same vein even. You'd be more glamorous on the other side, where beauty and romance reside. What she writes you is genius, but you had to delete it, drag it in the trash. It was secret, concede defeat, code deranged angels, deny her. If she sends the message three ways, you'll get it in tripartite stew. All virtual, electronical, in a Victorian instant message or a voicemail from the Marquis de Sade. An instant message from your mother covers hers bleeping. About Thanksgiving, another thicket. There are deer in the woods behind your mother's house. You lurk behind her text box. This time, you were only trying to put her to sleep, but she wouldn't behave. You shot so many horses out from under her, but she would not rest. You let her think that would be it, that she wouldn't have given you her precious insides. On the edge of grovel and granted, you sit astride her back and tied her hands. This tender captaincy, this grainy stash, this hardened fossator under her eyes. You're turning the equator and groping along an edge to the crisp teeth perched on her purple lips, hiding your treasure and seek. Phase down. Now you play at illusions. I think we should just be friends, if any of that mattered. You'd have already gnawed off your own leg. You are refuge at the end of a dangerous path. The Navy put microbes on the boots of colored men to mimic the tracking of deadly viruses. The chemical warfare heats up. Over dinner with your brother, he coughs. It sounds like her on the phone afterwards, dragging the infestations, everyone dragging. You watch the men march on television. She is a letter in the envelope of your body. A general with your father's mouth sputters over documents, something about obstruction and leaning. You crease, she unfolds. The bold paragraph in the dimple of her back is blue. She is here, but you can't see her. It's another blank mirror, an atom thumb. Between seats, the heads spill in cracks, silent, nodding. She runs by the aisle. You make excuses, run after. You cannot find her. You search the labyrinthine basement, a wall that curves whitely. Run your hand along, pursuing space, the curvature of blank longing up the stairs, two at a time, outside to where a man freezes and smokes a cigarette. Or is it an icicle? Or is it the bicycle your brother left in the shed pouring from his face, the past in his cheeks, something green and rusting, humid, a nightmare, the one in which you, breathless, re-enter the hall and sit too many rows behind her and her girlfriend. You are burned. It's all buried. If there were a dreaming here, it would begin even between arch. If thunder were a vowel, this is the lip it would occupy. Petroglyph. The night your chest exploded, you got a boy to take your mind off. Unlike the other boys you'd loved, you fucked this one. Anything to fill the hole she'd left. 
took him inside to push everything else out. In the daylight, the apartment smelled of latex and bitter sweat and a black hole gate at the corner of the bed. You sent him on his way. The easy anonymity of straight people. There are so many of them. She doesn't answer. In the morning of a night, the lover has not called. The lips you thirst for on another's neck. Next to a familiar body, a chasm grows in the mattress. No turning back the back you've turned to covet a ghost. Your heart a black water tank waiting behind the house for a drought that never comes. You took her silence for assurances, feverish manacles. The night is longer than a star's crossing and in it, you sink. Darting flies leave red blotches the size of a quarter. A man sleeps wrapped inside a palm frond on the side of a dusty road. Cows bawl all night long for their masters. The birds wake you with their cries. Even the sea heaves with sighs. All is calling. Will you leave this dengue plateau? The hills of Lavanti wither beneath the moon that beats back the darkness of the plain. Shadows call her name to a lightning sky. Against hope and the force of the sea, you weave her face in the sand. The mask, memory, leaves you. And then we're going to go back to the beginning. Why? So this is Palimpsest. You are a third generation beast in a first generation world of open legs. You were six when you read your mother's Marquis de Sade. It explains so much about things in the house. <laughs> Kama Sutra at seven but you remained unimpressed. Likewise at eight, by the flaccid illustrations and the joy of sex. Yet, the paintings of Shoji at nine, kimonos parted over thick white penises, the arc of them shining into pleated vulvas. You talk to them first, pay close attention to details, are interested and easily amused. Women like that. Always a voracious reader, you turn their pages, memorize the deep structure of their grammar, their adjectival clauses, a question in private that puts them off guard. Women are so polite, so crisscrossed with borders. Sometimes it's like stealing, taking something you don't really want just to get away with it. Sometimes you tell them you love them, sometimes not often, this is true. You hold back enough to keep them curious, women like that. Wounded enough to be salvageable, women like that too. Fixing things, taking in the broken wing you drag like a decoy. You are hungry, each one tastes different. Lavish tongue wherever they push your mouth. Creases slick with sweat and hair and the particular liquid of an armpit. You are not clean. You are not fresh. You are not pleased with extended foreplay. You want the fuck. Your hands as full of cunt as a stretch can dare. The edge of pain and fear. Their screams, delicious bells peeling. Small, rough, soft hands grabbing. Sometimes you make an offering of yourself. They think they take, and you open wide to swallow them whole. When you can't fuck, hunger makes you walk the streets alone and weep. If the moon is full, your womb is an aching crater. The doctor says your hormones are fucked up. She wants you to take the pill to stabilize them. They make you feel pregnant and bitter, and you won't stop smoking. You quit taking them though it means you will get cancer. The eggs struggle against the membrane and wait to be let out, die and decay there, festering cysts. 
On the sonogram, your ovaries like asteroids against the tulips of your fallopian tubes. When you can't fuck, you write about not fucking. You plan the next escapade. Have dreams where you hook up with blue-eyed Australian men. You kiss women young enough to be your daughters, masturbate several times a day, and get no work done. Your friends say that this is good for you, that you need to stop fucking so much, that if you do it less, you will think about it less. They are lying as usual. You think they are jealous of how you feed, how they repress their own gluttony. You think of sins, of church, of priests, of how the hood of the clitoris is like the nave of a cathedral. You are not penitent. When you haven't fucked for long enough, you make bad fuck judgments. You fuck a lawyer who has never fucked a woman before. Women are so kind, says the virgin. Women are sensitive and caring. Her hope is a virus. You say nothing. She makes good rum cake and wants to watch TV. You fuck her tiny cunt with three fingers while you patiently suck her clit. You are unceremonious. You disabuse. You fuck your best friend the night before your father's funeral. You fuck your ex's best friend the week before you get back together with your ex. You fall in love. You fall in love with a star in a different constellation, city, state, relationship. Her lovers have good credit and dark hair. She meets you in the back room of your cunt. You fuck her in the armchair before the fireplace when her lover is away. Pull down the laces of her mouth and shove your hand into the bruised cuff. Her face, a quick flush of heat, lips purple from your teeth. You blind, bind, beat. Her geography wears at your nipples. You map her in reticent bodies. Know a crystal glass by how it sings beneath your moistened fingers. You lend money. When you are not fucking, your generosity knows no bounds. When you have no more money, you share your food. When you have no more food, you give good advice. Everyone tells you, you should be a therapist. You have been lying since you were six. The Marquis de Sade was all about presentation. Your luteinizing hormone will not release the eggs. The gynecologist laughed. Cunt judgment. You were 18 years old and she thought your dickless state was a joke. You are not a joke. And you have your own dicks. You refuse to make love. Take the consumptive tunnel and give it fuck. The edge of the tub, the arm of the sofa, your brother's rocking horse, fruit, vegetables, tongues, fists, nipples, fingers, toes, toothbrushes, bottles, candles, handles, plastic, porcelain, silicone, glass. You are not injured. You are not healing. You are taking it lying down. Thank you. Hi, it's so good to see so many of you all, like not in one of those little bitty Facebook pictures. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I found it. Um, proposition. Before one more block is raised, and the plans drawn to erect yet another skyscraping phallus. Let us first consider the attributes of constructing something that goes down. That's right, a giant vulva building. Imagine people going to work in an immense pussy, taking elevators down, down, down to inner earth where no doubt it smells of amethysts and clay. We will prime the entryway with manicured shrubs or wild, sprawling, springy bushes. The illusion of being unkept. Perhaps we are closer to God here on earth. Imagine how much nearer we could become 
if we sought her center instead of her face. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have Kentucky in the house tonight, which is really, really good um, to come from Kentucky and see some friendly faces. So um, this next, these next couple poems will be um, an homage to the region where I hail from for Appalachia. This piece is called My Kind of Woman. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Tall drink of water, she got a secret sort of smile. She got a good voice and bowed long legs. A white father, a black mother, claims Indian roots somewhere back there. She's not sure where. She keep them in a closet full of hooded specters right next to the boxes of special occasion lingerie. She smoke loose leaf, but only when she drinks. She drinks only if it's strong, only if it's sweet. She can curse and loves hard. She used to wear blue, but now it's red most of the time. She got dreadlocks, a gingham shift, and a Confederate flag for a belt buckle. She call her boots shit kickers. A Bible rides around in her back seat. If you're lucky and she's lonesome, waiting around for that no good man, she might lift her shirt and show you the scar he left, webbing up her ribs. She draws when she's relaxed and she always relaxed. She can cook up a storm when she's happy. She can smell rain. Bony in places and hippie in others. She blushes in spring and cackles in the fall. She a good old gal, fine lines and all. <laughs> um, I'm a member of a group called the Afrolatian Poets. And um, sometimes we travel together through Appalachia. And um, the last time we went through together, um, we ended up passing a place called Negro Mountain, and I don't know if you're familiar with that place. Um, yeah, it's a, that's right, and uh, we were all a little shocked. We uh, got out of the car and took pictures by the sign, and of course we had to invent stories about how this mountain became known as Negro Mountain. Um, so this is my invention. It is, it is rooted in a little bit of truth. It's a, it's a bop, so you'll hear some lyrics in between. Legend of Negro Mountain. It would take a man black as loam to have a mountain named for his skin. Before any highways platted Allegheny crests, Nemesis took a bullet in his back while hewing down clay-skinned men. They parted before him, felled like saplings before axe and flame. I know moonrise, I know star rise, Lay this body down. I walk in the moonlight. I walk in the starlight to lay this body down. Nemesis was buried in the third eye of the mountain where his blood had turned the soil black. On this, the same night he would join his ancestors, walking trees uprooted from the swamps he'd been born in. They followed Spica, their branches raking across the sky and blotting out the stars. They stayed bad dreams, lost leaves, bark and limbs, lost a whole white winter to reach his body. I'll walk in the graveyard. I'll walk through the graveyard to lay this body down. I'll lie in the grave and stretch out my arms, lay this body down. The trees folded constellations into the ground where Nemesis fell. His ancestors, hauled by blood, followed these root walkers from swamp to summit. And like the trees, they remained, stayed by his body long enough for a whole mountain to be named black as a bullet in skin. I go to judgment in the evening of the day when I lay this body down. My soul and your soul will meet in the day when I lay this body down. Um, over the past year or so, I've been doing a lot of research on um, women who've been lynched, black women who've been lynched in the U.S., particularly 13 black women who were lynched in Kentucky. 
Um, but my research got started um, by finding out about a woman named Laura Nelson. And if you Google her name, she's actually got a lynching postcard. They used to do lynching postcards as souvenirs. And um, Woody Guthrie's father was actually on the bridge in Oklahoma where she was hung with her son. And he, he later became obsessed with um, her story and ended up writing ballads about her. So this is, this is for uh, Laura and it's called Lynching Postcard. And it begins with um, an epigraph. You can stretch my neck on that old river bridge. Woody Guthrie, don't kill my baby and my son. I want to imagine there is no rope hankering for a brown woman's throat and the asterism that was her voice. Next, that her arches rest on something as firm yet giving as loam. And there is no faceless mob, no ambivalent tree line, no sepia stream below, no proverbs, no promised land. My God, what is left for her but an absence of light? Whose ancestor could she possibly be now? I want to reach for her ring finger hand. I want to tidy her hair, button her sleeves, smooth the wrinkles from her dress, set the angle of her head back to where her spine has not yet given way to the pressure of hand rolled hemp and gravity's blurred desire. I want to open her eyes, tell her 100 years later, that she should have been born a gust of cobalt, a blue ember against the granite swath of sky, that she hangs on still as more than a souvenir. Um, and this one is, uh, this next one's a contrapuntal, it's a three-part contrapuntal, and it's uh, about the people we see in dreams. This is called On Falling, and it starts with an epigraph. There's a dream that I believe. When I wake up, it goes away. Sunday Valley, I don't mind. It begins with the gray hour, a downpour, the dawn sun, walking trees, a call, a fog, a slow procession, a shadow sewn into a hem. There are no fingerprints here. There are no numbers, only ceremony, a blizzard, blossoms falling over an orchard of upturned, veiled faces. Someone is a bride today. Someone's mouth will be empty of rice. Someone will be born an ancestor. Hear this bell, a drum, a slow, sweet wind. A voice paddling through a lake that was once a grove of spirits cut loose, wondering how anything could ever end. Two. First there's a lasso and you're drowning. No, first you're drowning, then there's a lasso, but I do not save you, you're too heavy. Instead, I save a locket full of your hair that's been bitten in half. Now I have a tooth wandering as loose as a wraith in a haint house. Then there's blood spilt from your palm. I mark my forehead with it in a complex line, painted gold. I make a vow, break it. There is a white tent in a desert of red, too much red. You let go first. For some reason, I don't mind. Three. I am young, too young to remember much except falling for something bright in the water. Then there are hands, dark brown and big as wings. My mother's mouth floats above the wings, a vowel blurred by light. Seconds rob me of my life. I do not care. I am something new. The sky is a mirage. My hair tangles in fronds growing beside me. You crawl inside my shell. A dream sets us adrift. And this is, this is the part I like to call the prestige. It feels like a magic trick. Mm -hmm. It begins with the gray hour, 
First there's a lasso. I am young, a downpour, and you're drowning. Too young to remember much, the dawn sun. No, first you're drowning except falling for something, walking trees. Then there's a lasso bright in the water, a call of fog, but I do not save you. Then there are hands, a slow procession. You are too heavy, dark brown and big as wings. Instead, my mother's mouth floats, a shadow sewn into a hem. I save a locket full of your hair above the wings, a vowel that's been bitten in half. There are no fingerprints here. Now I have a tooth wandering, blurred by light. There are no numbers as loose as a wraith in a haint house, only ceremony, a blizzard. Then there's blood spilt, uh, then there's blood spilt from blossoms following, uh, falling over an orchard from your palm of upturned, veiled faces. I mark my forehead with it. Seconds rob me of my life. Someone is a bride today in a complex line. I do not care. Someone's mouth will be empty of rice, painted gold. Someone will be born an ancestor. I make a vow. I am something new. Hear this bell, a drum, a slow sweet wind. Break it. The sky is a mirage, a voice paddling through a lake. There is a white tent in a desert of red, too much red. My hair tangles in fronds that was once a grove of spirits growing beside me. Cut loose, you let go first, wondering how anything could ever end. For some reason, you crawl inside my shell. I don't mind, a dream sets us adrift. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm not used to all this um, city air. Uh, <laughs> get a little choked up. All right. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't bring um, some of you all who are familiar with my Facebook account. Know I like to talk about the mermaids and the unicorns and the mythological creatures. So I brought one today, but it's not either of those. It's called It's the Quiet Ones You Have to Watch Out For. And it begins with an epigraph. It is one thing to read about dragons and another to meet them. Ursula K. Le Guin, a wizard of Earthsea. When she first arrives, you barely notice the elevation in temperature because that could be anything. Maybe leftover steam mist from your shower and not the benign smoke from two armored nostrils. And several months later, Perhaps a glimmer of almost invisible, iridescent scales catches the fluorescence when she shifts her haunches to accommodate your replacing the toilet paper roll or a reach into the medicine cabinet for eye drops. There, when you close the mirrored door, you might glimpse the flare of her opalescent eye, accompanied by the scent of something that reminds you pleasantly of burning leaves or if she's in a foul mood of burnt hair. And then nothing for years. You could have been sleepwalking or daydreaming or making an 11-11 wish at the time. Memory makes no excuses, remains for now content to catalog. There used to be a time when a dragon could appear in all her opulence, showing off the infernal nature of her maw to thrill a body into submission. If she fancied your build and the way you said her name, she might hypnotize you until you slumbered standing upright. She'd let you live so she could sow her seed, her most vulnerable and most precious thing, into your warm, soft belly for safekeeping. Later, much later, she'd return, show up sudden as midnight to a moonlit reveler from no matter where she was in the world, no matter how deep in the earth, she'd hear the voice of her own coming from inside your skin. She'd open you up right there in your middle chakra seam and deliver an infant dragon tangled in your entrails into the world to enjoy its first fresh meal, yet throbbing with the sour sweet tang of life. 
Now the dragons have all outlived the usefulness of their etymology. They are so old, they have forgotten how to pronounce their own names, have learned to wait without anxiety, have learned to hide in the light so they might find an introverted keeper, a body that doesn't tend to stray too far, a body that likes to settle into its home as though just beneath the plumbing there lies buried a hidden hoard of gold as familiar as bone. She will wait for you first to notice her, then to realize you've not mistaken a scale or hooked tooth for shadow, her veiny fabric of wing, curved talons and barbed tail for apparition or fatigue, because when you finally finally seen her for what she is, her whole hungry length snaking from the plunger up to the shower head, a foreleg resting behind the faucet nudging the lotion against the hand soap and toothpaste, you will find you are unable to remember a time when she was not always there. And I'll end uh, with a, a last poem about dragons. They're my thing right now. Um, um, and another epigraph. I like those. Um, this is called How Swallowtails Become Dragons. Having opened to their fullest, they opened further. Carl Phillips, Distortion. Too early we grow teeth. Too early we are not content, not knowing. The longer we remain one way, steeping, the more brilliant we become. And so harvest comes early. We cannot help that the resin running through us is so hot and so sweet it overwhelms, changing us. We cannot help the one day we desire to open another's flesh, to know it better and our own. Here, in a world of blood, not so far below some hazed, veined sky, we do not remember the sun. We wish to breathe fire. Too early, though we do not know it yet by name, we wish for alchemy, water to blood, Blood to gold, gold to flesh, flesh to wings, wings to wind. Thank you. I thought I might cuddle you a bit, as opposed to all the, the fucking that's been going on. I'm just playing. <laughs> just playing. There are uh, any LL Cool J fans in the room? Okay, all right. I said that uh, a couple of months ago at a nursing home, and it did not go over <laughs> at all. Um, if you like him, you might know this title. When I'm alone in my room, sometimes I stare at the wall, and in the back of my mind, I hear my conscious call me Ishmael. <laughs> call me sailor, but not captain. Call me fishhook, clean. Call me multi-purpose fish scale weighing self-obsession. Call me fishtail and a siren silk sheets, thief in the night buccaneer. Call me freightliner hall, hacking through a baby humpback. The Bible study leading sea world trainer dead between Shamu's teeth. Call me extinct and extinguished, son of a slave girl expelled to the desert for being himself. Call me miracle, opposite mirage, three part sea, but bountiful land, call me mangy pasture, wild buffalo, archer, arrow, call me sheared, call me back to the shepherd, call me lamb. So I recognize that we've left Valentine's Day in the dust, right? But I'm kind of still in the mood. So I hope that you'll indulge me and let me read you a love letter, a love poem or two, all right? Uh, this starts with an epigraph from Langston Hughes. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. Love letter to Flavor Flav. I think I love you. How you suck fried chicken grease off chalkboard fingers in public. I walk the wrong way down an escalator with a clock around your neck. How you rapped about the poor with a gold tooth grin. How your gold teeth spell your name, how you love your name 
is beautiful. You shout your name 100 times each day. They say, if you repeat something enough, you can become it. I'd like to know. Does Flav or Flav sound ugly to you? I think it's slightly beautiful. I bet you love mirrors. Tell the truth. When you find plastic Viking horns or clown shades staring back, is it beauty you see or vaudeville? To express myself honestly enough, that, my friend, is very hard to do. Those are Bruce Lee's words. I mention Bruce Lee here only because you remind me of him. That's a lie. But your shades do mirror a mask he wore as Green Hornet's trusty sidekick. No, I'm not calling names. Chuck D would have set cities on fire had you let him. You were not public enemy's sidekick. You hosed down whole crowds and loud mouth flame retardant spit. You did this only by repeating your name. I think I love you. I think I really might mean it this time. William. Can I call you William? I should have asked 27 lines ago, what have you become? How you've lived, saying nothing save the same words each day is a kind of freedom or beauty. Please tell me I'm not lying to us. Nineteen ninety eight. Maybe it's the half communion wafer yellow moon in my eye. Maybe it's the thug wind mingling fragrant herb firing shots across the synapse that takes me back to summer outcast, return of the G. I was a bone, head caught between middle and high, private and public school. Me and B used to run the drain in his father's fists a crown, used to do C-sections on Swisher Sweets, talk shit about Rodney's chipmunk teeth, and deep down, I must have been aching to knock one out. Me and B are rocking back and forth on plastic porch chairs when Ipsy's number one gossip approached. Sheila said, Rodney was talking reckless about my younger brother. I inhaled a pulsing red fist from the midsection, blew smoke through bull nostrils, knew exactly what to do. We placed a few calls, told every teen on the block they should come to the park around noon. I grabbed my pigskin, set teams of five. B snapped a short bullet pass to Rodney and five guys nailed his back to grass. Rained down sharp laughs and elbows to ribs, teed off on his groin. I tried to drill a hole in his face. Blasted my knuckles against his incisors again and again, and I can't go on talking to you this way any longer. All this time, I've been working up something to say about that liminal place between manhood and cartoon cool, something stupid like that. Rodney, I chased you through cul-de-sacs and lawns, chased you west through the state of Michigan, and still haven't figured out how to finish this letter. I just want you to know, and I understand this is no consolation, but every time I'm in the heat of a huddle, in a gym or barber shop, when I swig cold brews and watch mob flicks by myself. Rodney, you chase after me. You kick my ass. You nail me square to the ground. You all right? Okay, all right. Just making sure. Um, up until a few years ago, I'd never taken public transportation, which explains why my first day in New York today I got lost off the subway. Um, but I used to take this campus bus. I was in Bloomington, Indiana. I went to grad school there every day. And I got really obsessed about riding this bus and I wanted to write this book called The Bus Driver Chronicles. Um, but all the poems are bad. And so this is one of the few that stuck around. Um, and I guess the other thing I'll say is sometimes I wonder if in observing the world for my poetry, I've forgotten how to live in it, right? 
And so that idea legislates some of the book and definitely this poem. I'm a sad, sad man. So sad, I can't remember how to ride a bus right. Just the other day, I forgot who I was and couldn't budge to help a human in need because the pin in my pocket was poking my thigh saying, use me, use them, write their stories. As if I am not them, that woman and her two little girls mounting some 10 ton thing daily, fair or no fair, rust bucket but not broken down, traveling at a pace beyond my control. And how sad it is, because I'm really not them. Most days, I keep at least a buck in my pocket to pay the driver, and if not a briefcase which says, I'm good for it. That was somehow miserable to admit. I'm only telling you this because you're hearing a poem, probably spend perfectly good bar nights feeling the world deeply with the ballpoint pen in your pocket. And though a tad abnormal to discuss, all humans want to understand everything and for everyone to understand us. What I can't understand is what makes me see differently any three people on a bus. Maybe the saddest thing in the world is not knowing how to feel cold plastic bus seats without thinking of narrative arc, the 10,000 pains shifting uncomfortably from cheek to raw red cheek, and in any given moment, this. As you can probably tell um, from the love letter, I watch a lot of TV, and more TV, you know, than I should as a writer, probably. And one thing that I've noticed is that if you watch a lot of TV, characters named Marcus usually suck. Um, <laughs> in movies, right? Um, and so I wrote this guzzle about it because, you know, pisses me off a little. This is called Self-Dialogue with Marcus. In every movie, there's a snaggletooth thug who pimps broken speech or a snob poodle who shits for a living named Marcus. It's like Marcus is the sleeping infant who weeps without fail while you're tonguing her navel by starlight. Fuck every Marcus. He's why you sail a hole punch keel to nowhere you've never been. Rastas love Garvey. Ray's Methodist died Catholic. Ask Marcus to name a market for his prayers. Miller's no better. His bass music's fairly funky, but he'd write in couplets too. Marcus, who did this to you? Mr. Schenkenberg, who says this CK brief package is right? Why not free ball? It's got to be Marcus, meaning Mars or Aries in Rome. Today you got spacesuit high in your underwear to declare self-war. That's just like Marcus Aurelius pinning that progressive tender self-help text, then stoning 10,000 Christians' empire was his Marcus for that. In Marcus, Iowa, there's one market, five large churches, and a kid who can't absolve his base axe Jones. What's his Marcus? Tell me that. You can't tell what's homestead or honed to save your life. Nights, you shrivel through a rib and your yacht's gut, and though Marcus can rarely swim in film, still you live to drown another day. And the Marcus for this Marcus is most certainly Marcus. I'm going to read you a new one, too. Um, the first poem, I'm writing this new book. It's a project. I call it Call the Sack Pastoral. Um, I'm writing these sort of poems about ceaseless prayer to a higher power. Some of them are tasteless. Some of them are tasteful, like the first one, maybe. Um, but also, I'm writing praise poems to suburbia, right? Like a praise poem to and against the hermetically sealed lawn and the oozy sprinkler head because I think it'd be really nice to live in one of these neighborhoods, but I also hate them a little. Um, I was at home recently. My parents live in one of these neighborhoods. Um, the power went out, and I saw these three or four little kids looking at a football, right? Like, they didn't know what the fuck to do with it, right? 
Um, and so I wrote this. <laughs> Creation song in which a swift wind sucker punches a transformer. In which the transformer heaves projectile from the telephone pole. In which the pole snaps awake, its miter box guts emptied out over an oscillating fan. In which atomized rot reigns atop the crab apple's pet name pheromones, in which nobody notices. Creation song in which electrified shrapnel voids, bedazzled yard gnome, limestone garden ornaments, remote control Ferrari, real life Range Rover, in which somebody notices. Creation song in which six kids crowd around pigskin curious, the tallest boy prodding the ball with a stick. Creation song in which your online bank account is unavailable, in which your exquisite 60 inch flat screen is an HD plastic heap, in which the matchstick feels paleolithic and you could be making love. Creation song in which unattended sparks sizzle along a chain link fence, in which everyone heads for the gates. I think I'm gonna do a dance break real quick for you. Yeah. Ars Poetica, and this is backwards, right? But Ars Poetica in the mode of J Live. It's like this, Anna. Shell bang bear with a bat, Anna. Vat of gunpowder shed and a famished bird fed off scraps, Anna. Gut itch flown south for life, Anna. Dropper stool, self peck slow, and a wince or stool dropped again, and a bird sifting through his shit, and a slug built by a bird's beak, and a small handgun, it's like this, and a gun, the bird doesn't grip, it's like this, and a, it's like that, it's like that, and like this. Can I read you another love, love letter? Is that all right? Cool. This is uh, another one of my heroes. Love letter to RuPaul. You have one of the longest, thickest, most veined, colossal set of hands that I have ever seen. And frankly, they cast a spell on me. Not that I'm the type of man who goes around checking out other men's hands but I know tightly tucked cuticles when I see them. <laughs> Even sexier is the hourglass shaping chokehold you can put on a mic. You could hurl a two foot monkey wrench at a mirror or pull out and push in a date's chair with the flick of a wrist. I bet you don't though. Bet you've never carried a man up four flights of stairs, limp arms flailing every which way. And if you have, I bet you took care to cradle his neck, to avoid banisters, and to walk slowly because you are fierce in the way only a six foot seven black drag queen could be. And one of my earliest memories, you are wearing a pink sequin dress, endorsing a hamburger, good enough for a man, maybe a woman. I am a black man who has never worn pink. Not a polo to a country club, not gators to a church, and still, that commercial ravished me. How hard to be sandwiched between what and who you are, tickled by every cruel wind, critic voyeur playing rough beneath your skirt. How raw you must be to sit before a camera, legs uncrossed. I've, uh, I'm working at a literary journal right now, and I realize that a lot of the poems that I get are the same thematically, right? It's like the, the poets are good at keeping up with the Joneses. So years ago, I worked at another journal, and it was like, um, for one submission period, we got all these poems about pomegranates. Um, <laughs> then we got these uh, self-portraits with landscapes, but there were no landscapes in the poems, right? And so this is from the season of Abauds, um, if you don't know, an abode is a morning song written for lovers departing. 
And all the abods I was reading at the time were these overly detailed, sort of dainty poems, and so I decided I'd write my own and make fun of it, but um, then something happened. It's called Interrupting a Bod, Ending an Epiphany. Could I call this poem an abod if I wrapped it in fragrant tissue paper? If I locked this morning in the mine safe deposit box and polished it 66 times per day until the sky's description noted the number of feathers on a sparrow's left wing and the crab grass jutting from his uppity beak. I once wrote a poem about a fruit fly orgy in a grape's belly. Its crescendoed combustion was supposed to represent the speaker's feelings for a wife named Joy. That poem never really worked out. This poem is aware of its mistakes and doesn't care. This poem wants to be a poem so bad it'll show you a young, smitten pear poised in an S on a downy bed. The man inhales the woman's sweet hair and whole fields of honeysuckle and jasmine bloom inside him. He inhabits a breath like an anodyne and I think I could call this poem an abode if it detailed new breath departing his mouth. I think I could get away with that because who knows what that even means. Maybe I mean that's safer than saying it straight like this is about the woman I'll marry. How one summer she hit snooze four times each sunrise. This is about her smiling and nodding off and smiling and listening to me mumble into the back of her perfect freckled shoulder about anything but poetry. And this morning at my desk, in the midst of a breath, I remember not every moment needs naming. I know precisely what to call this. Thank you. I might read you one more. Um, you ever not want to go somewhere because you knew something was going to happen, right? But you ignored your intuition. When I was in Bloomington, I went to this, uh, I'm a big hip hop fan, right? But sometimes I can't, uh, I can't stand for some of the misogyny. But I went to go see this rapper anyway. His name is Twister, right? I thought, I don't have anything to do. He's in town. There's not much entertainment. Fuck it. Um, Basically, this is just what happened. I just wrote it down. It's called To You. They were curious. The 12 blaggy back t-shirts chanting on stage at the local college bar. Their chorus, Who's Sucking Dick Tonight? And from the back of the room where I noted polos and slick dresses bobbing yes to chest-throbbing bass, every belt crack Backhand and tongue bash in me said, Son, do the right thing and stay in your line. A line I took to mean, Mind your business. Don't spring the fire alarm. Don't set the joint ablaze. Don't rush a live mic pleading to the baggy black shirt. Stop, please. There's a spindly raised hand with chip red polish quaking too fast in this smoke free bar. And a dainty mom lugging her son piggyback, leveled a letterman to answer your call. I'm trying to tell you I've been over this again and again. What type of man would let a child in this poem? What type of man could stand in that building and not know how to be a normal human being, could not glean exigently something of addiction, its manic blood itch, comprehend what can happen when certain little boys in this poem can do nothing but stay in their line. See, I'm doing it again. Damn this business of frame and context. Damn these sorry lines and hear me now. I don't rightly know who sucked off whom or what variety of human I've become, but if you don't close this book, I mean drop this poem straight away. You, me, that boy, his mom, and every drunk dancing fool in this shattered glass disco ball world, we are all of us all together fucked. Thanks.
another round of applause for Erica, Bianca, and Marcus. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We've got books for sale in the back, and the wine is free, so please stay. Thanks.